much for coming out. I'm very, very pleased and honored. And um, don't know quite where to begin, but I guess I'll begin with the preference. I'll tell you a little bit about myself that I lived in South Carolina. I was born in South Carolina. And so I've been here for quite a few years. And what inspired me to write, I attribute it to my mother. She, I was the oldest child, and therefore the oldest child usually gets a little bit more attention until the baby comes along. And so she talked to me quite a bit about her courtship, the marriage, and her grandparents. Um, and so I dedicate this book to her. I say, A Mother's Love Inspired Generations. This book is dedicated to our mother, Estelle Stone Bell, who showed us the way through the storms of hardship. She taught us honesty. She taught us that hard work will not kill us, but will make us strong. She told us to work for what we wanted and not depend upon others. She taught us compassion and how to love without saying the word. During our beginnings, we were poor and humble, but we had and still possess a great spirit within us that has helped us make a way when none seemed possible. Our success must be measured not by our current material possessions, but by the odds we had to overcome to be where we are today. What follows in this book are struggles, accomplishments, and triumphs of eight children growing up with their parents on a farm in Longtown, South Carolina, four brothers and four sisters. This book is a gift to the descendants of Joe Bell and Estelle Stone Bell, their children, great-grandchildren, and great-great-grandchildren, and future generations. A people should know their history. Our story serves as footprints of our past. And may future generations find these footprints helpful as they chart their own course. A great people is not ashamed of its past. The past becomes the building blocks for those who follow, and so it shall be with our family. Um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about uh, the setting in South Carolina. In South Carolina, uh, I'm not very good at maps, never have been, but our lives began in Kershaw County and in Fairfield County. Now, somewhere down in the lower part of South Carolina, there was a, a river called the Watery River. And with the Watery River, it was the, the, the passageway that was used by the slaves to come up. They worked their way up to Kershaw County and to Fairfield County. And so uh, that's what happened. And so all of our ancestors, both sides of my family, they all began down uh, either in Kershaw or Fairfield. And they travel the route of the river, the Watery River, which is very quite well known in that area of South Carolina. So it was the Watery River that brought them, that uh, they made that passageway. And following emancipation, then our ancestors began to build churches and uh, went from house to house to build their churches. And first it was one church, then it was two churches, and all of my ancestors, the great-great-grandparents, all was part of that movement with regard to churches. And one of the experiences my mom uh, in, uh, always told me stories. So there was always a rush to get all work done by sundown. The chicken began their slow march to their coops to be placed out of harm's way. Stray dogs and foxes were always on the lookout for a meal. The farm animals were taken to the branch to get their last drink of water for the night. The, the hogs were fed. Children playing ceased as parents stood outside yelling, come home, come home now. It was early to bed and early to rise. 
we would go to bed with the chickens and get up with the roosters. Once they began their cockadoos, there was no sleeping. Sunday was church going time. Parents walked miles to churches carrying their children in their arms and around their shoulders with little one trotting to keep up. Walking or riding wagons were the only means of transportation at that time for our family. As children, we enjoyed picking blackberries, yellow and red grapes, and black locusts on our way to church. The sweet tasting juice was a joy. We learned early as we watched where we put our hands and feet, as the snakes loved those fruit as well. There was always plum trees along the road too. During the long walk on the dusty road, white fishermen terrorized us by driving inches within inches of our bodies, forcing us to into the ditches and kicking up red dust. I recall the red dust sticking to my beautiful white starched dress, my black patent leather shoes, and my hair, which had been so carefully combed and put oil on by my mom and curl. Mom did her best to help wipe the dust off my shoes, and there was no solution for removing it from my hair and dress, which was changed to colors of bright glowing red. It was always a frightening experience while walking to church on a Sunday morning to serve a God of all the people. We prayed that the men would mi miss us, but it rarely happened. My mom began telling me stories at, at an early age as I was growing up, and she continued to tell them until she was probably 85 years or older. And as far as I can remember, my mother said that I was nervous as a child. And the reason I was nervous as a child, because when she was carrying me, she was nervous because of all the happiness going on in the neighbor, in the area. And that's something you heard about Hans. You heard about Hans? Well, that came up, that there were real Hans in the, in the, um, there. And my mama learned about these hands after she moved. My father had to work far away from the house. So she was alone in this isolated area. And she began to um, see people coming from the pond. And they would never reach her house. So she was wondering why these people are traveling, but they are never passing the house. And so one day when she was sitting met her Aunt Laura, where the women would go and uh, wash clothes once a week. She was telling her about the strange happenings and seeing people and hearing uh, the or organ playing. Like, who could be playing that organ? Well, the lady who was supposed to be, was supposed to, who knew how to play the organ had been dead for quite a while. So Mama told this story to Aunt Laura, and Aunt Laura says, well, they're the hands. We got hands all over the place. Everywhere you go, they are hands. And they create problems, but I ignore them. Well, mom was not ready to listen that she lived in an isolated place all by herself all day, and there are hands roaming around. So I told mama fell in love with Dr. Miles Nervine. And on the night of my birth, that also that she took so much miles nerving. It didn't do me any harm, but everybody was, was, she was quite out of it and very sleepy. So those are the kinds of things that, um, that I encountered growing up. And she never stopped telling stories about, um, about the area and that the meanness that went on and how one could be beaten and starved to death and I was the rebel who thought that if I didn't like what was going on, I was ready to challenge them. And she would let me know that that was not going to work, that they had the power. And she would always tell me about the slavery time, that you would be beaten if you didn't do what you were told. Well, um, but I still became 
a rebel. Um, I went to a segregated school, and every morning we pledge allegiance to the flag. And we talked about giving to the world the best we have and the bus best will come back to us. And in going to the school that I attended, uh, it was a school that you was wondering, half, one third of us was my skin color, one, another third was much deeper and dark, the other third was fair skinned, some blue eyes, some brown eyes, some blonde, and that's the school that we had. Uh, and recall the date that the nurse who came to this colored school that she was told to go to, she just about passed out when she walked into the door. And we thought it was quite funny because we all played together. We didn't have a problem with each other's skin tones, but obviously it was a shock to her. Um, so our, one of the th part that we worked very, very hard, we were not sharecroppers. Our families, all of uh, uh, our ancestors, our great-grandparents, all had land of their own. How they got it, we never, I never researched it, but they were uh, homeowners, land on land. And so uh, we could go to school, we didn't have to have this sharecropper say, well, you can't go, your children cannot go to school until all the cotton is picked, until harvest. But we were able to go to school. We had that freedom to go to school. And so we did. Um, there was a lot would happen uh, because of reading and writing. If you did not read and write very well, sometimes you may be taken advantage of. But what I liked so much about learn in that school, our teacher, who was so devoted, and every day, every morning, that you would pledge allegiance to the flag. You would also say the Lord's Prayer. And you would also talk about giving to others. And um, it, was, it was a great opportunity that we uh, learn. Give to the world the best you have and the bus will come back to you. So she was a teacher that had um, 50 children, and she's supposed to be teaching 50 children all day. And um, those were some of the parts that we had. And um, we had little, and we ran into a problem when my father became ill, was unable to work, and um, everybody was, most folks was poor. So when he's unable to work, then my mother thought, okay, I'll go up to the merchants and say, gee whiz, I want to borrow this and have this because the ro rule was you can buy all you need for your farm and then you pay us at harvest time. But a woman going up and wanting to uh, buy and run the farm, no, no, you can't, we can't let you have it. Your husband must sign. And my mother, even though th at that time, said, I am doing the work. I don't need my husband to sign for me. Now, she was kind of like, okay, that was not how you talked. And, but you didn't get the money. They were not allowed. So at that point in time, I tell it, it is a time I call crying time for a family. Husband is sick. Child has rheumatic fever. And you cannot buy what you need to run a farm. And so my mother did the best she could, and it was bad. And I uh, described that as a, a moment in life that I would not forget so well, that in America, as we sat without uh, food, because other people didn't have it to give to us because they were shot. But I remember what it was like to try to eat what was bread, but it was bread that had been shifted, that she sh sh shifted this bread and tried to get some meal out for us. And she uh, was not, got very little. And this um, cooking, this bread, 
we ate it because we had nothing else. And the, our throats scratched because of the pain. And I remember those times and experience. I remember what it was like as a child and s the youngsters and moms sitting around crying because we were hungry. And I said, in America, in America, those kinds of things was happening to one family. But um, we always remember an uncle that we always thought wasn't really. He was a character. He was different than all everybody else, did things wild. And so he came by to see us. And he says, what's going on here? Crying? No food? What you mean, no food? There are plenty of food. There's lots of food. And, and you're here hungry? Well, we don't have any food. Well, the next morning, he shows up with, I think, two or three crocker sacks, crocker sacks full of food. And we says, Mama wanted to know, where did he get this food? Now he had no car, no transportation. How did he get all this food to bring to us? Of course, we figured it all out, uh, what happened. But that is just part of, of the journey that I have. I don't want to talk all the time. I want you all to ask me questions. But my transition of coming to Connecticut at an early age in 1957, I came to Norwich with a six-month-old child. Well, I had foresight. I was not going to get stuck in South Carolina or any place with a baby and have more babies and more babies, and I would never be able to escape. So I was what I call a runaway mother and wife. So I left the husband behind, and I came to Norwich, and I stayed. My father and brothers also had been here uh, just about a year before I came. So that's part of my journey. And I say that I left South Carolina where it was um, Segregation was, was very plentiful. And um, I think of, of one incident where they decided that they've now Supreme Court passed and we're about to have integrated schools. But what happened is the buses, it didn't change. The little children had to go on buses to ride all the way up still to a segregated school. These little children didn't have thin jackets and they uh, were crying. And I'm saying, this is unfair. And so I said to the young men, I want you to climb up and go through the windows and open the doors and let these children in. They did. And we had a grand time. Um, a few days later, I got sick and I couldn't go to school. And when I did go to school, the bus, they said, you shouldn't, my goodness, what did they do? The police came and threatened to arrest these young men. Threatened if they ever do this again, they will all go to jail. And some said, Lottie, we're glad you weren't here. Because if you were here, you would have taken action. You would have talked back. And we all would have been in trouble. We would have stoned these po police officers. And I'm saying, that was a real blessing that I wasn't there because my path would have been a different path had I been confronted with this. And so, I guess you can say that I was born a rebel uh, from the very beginning. And when I came to Norwich, and then I'm saying, I had not reached the promised land yet when I arrived in Norwich because there you saw all the disc what was going on. People, you could not find an apartment. So these are just some of the um, experience I had. I wanted to share it, and I wanted to tell our story, my family's story, that we are not ashamed of the fact that we were hungry and did have. But what is joyful about it, that my sisters and brothers, that they all are doing, have done, done well in their college education, and that I have the most beautiful 
you ought to probably do too. The most beautiful nieces and nephews who are out here working in jobs that you thought at one time they would never have. Now I'm ready, you want to ask me some questions because when I start talking I really get wound up and, and have a little hard time. Yes. What year are you talking about when you were young, like five or six, walking to the church? What, what time frame was that? You want to talk in terms of, yeah, well, you counted. I was uh, maybe five or six, and I was born in 1936. I'm not good at calculating. So I was just a little girl, yeah. you know? And so, so you dealt with all that at an early age. But we had some fun times. Yep. When, yeah. when, you, when you came to Norwich, um, you were only 20? Yes. She calculate fast. Wow. <laughs> I, was, I, was tw I was 20 when I came to Norwich at an early age. And you know, and so you can talk about race, but you can also, what it is to be a young black woman single with, who left her husband with a baby trying to find work and all the other stereotypes that go with it. You had a question? You had said that there were 50 students in your class. About 50, school. yes. <coughs> How was that like for you and for the teacher? I used to teach and I had a maximum of 30 kids and that was fine. I, wasn't, I can't imagine 50. Yeah, I didn't teach, I was a student. Right, no, I know that, yeah. but uh, you, okay, I'll tell you, what your memory? i tell you my memory it was. It was a lot for a teacher to do this right. because you got, what is it, six grades going on. So you waited until your turn, and so you didn't misbehave, and she taught you didn't misbehave, but it was, got frustrating for me because I said, okay, this teacher has taught me all she can teach me. She can't teach me anymore. I need to go to another school. And there was not another school to go to. Um, and so I stayed and stayed at that school. And the only th thing part I liked about this, t about we w the principals, of do unto others as you have them do unto you. And all these other parts, and there would be plays that you would do, those skits. She was a wonderful teacher, um, but it was hard because after a while, I wanted to move on to another school. I could not move on. I couldn't move on because the rules would not allow me to move on. Um, so I was upset, so we tried to get myself promoted to another grade. And the teacher says, no, that's dishonest. I can't move you up. Can't do that. That's dishonest. And of course, my mother, who's very outspoken, she says, uh, well, you are keeping her back. You can't teach her anymore. You have taught all you can teach. You don't know how to teach her anymore, and you're keeping my child back. So we spent the summer crying because of that, because I would have to go back to school and I wasn't learning anything. Well, I decided I'm going to school. I'm going to ride that bus about 40 miles and I'm going to school. So how am I going to do that? I decided I'll just get on the bus and go. And I went to school and I registered. I gave them my correct address. They didn't ask me any question. I, so that's what I did. And in addition to that, I decided I'll cover my books. So when I got on the school bus, no one would know what school I was going to. And then I didn't talk to anybody. So anybody can get into my business and I wouldn't get into theirs. I did all that within one year until I was eligible to go to the school. And um, call it dishonesty, I call it surviving. Any other questions? Yes. In South Carolina, how did you react uh, back 
on May the 17th, 1954, when the Brown G. Board of Education opinion was issued by the Supreme Court. How did I react? Personally, I don't know because I probably was dealing with a whole lot of other stuff, but I know one thing. I was glad, but I know what happened is when they moved these children and they immediately built all these schools, they couldn't find money to build schools. They couldn't find money to buy us book, give us books. They couldn't find money for that, but by golly, these schools popped up all over, brand new schools. I took note of that. Any? Yes. Do you ever go back and find your husband? <laughs> <laughs> no, I did not. He came here, but that was no go, because I have learned you do, if someone don't do right the first time, you don't give them a chance the next time. It's over. <laughs> Leave it over. So that was it. But that was a wonderful experience. <laughs> you said your father and brother were here in Norwich when you arrived. Yeah. Where, where was your mother at that time? Had she passed? No, she hadn't. She just got smart. And when things don't go right, you find a way to move them out. I'm sorry, but you know, you, that's how you didn't do divorces at that time. You just kind of move them out. So she was, mom did wonderful. She uh, um, lived to be um, 90 some years old. And uh, through all of that, she had a grand time. Her children spoiled her. All she had to say, I won't. And she got, that's all I could say. So, and she thinks that her, her grandchildren, they grew up. She was a happy, happy person to attend uh, the graduation of her grandson when he uh, passed the, um, graduated from law school, passed the bar. So she see all these things of pure glory and wonderful to have happen to a family who was had so little and that sitting down with your children crying because of hunger, but yet look at them. And she really loved her, that part of achievement that happened with her children. And our great, my grandnieces and great grandnieces, they all have done well in our family. And so it is a, a journey, it is quite a journey and my mother was able to see the accomplishment of her children and grandchildren. Yes? I had the privilege of hearing you speak before, and then you spoke of your mom. And you uh, mentioned something about her going on this shopping. Well, he wants me to tell her, and I can't tell her uh, straight again. But my, <laughs> my mom, she has her way. And I told the story that she likes to come, to come to Connecticut and she likes to go shopping. And so we went to um, Burlington to shop. And so she was shopping and then she goes into a panic as we were about to go leave the store. She was panicked. What's going on, Ma? Oh, she was so nervous and she says, uh-uh. Oh, uh, and I says, Ma, I know you didn't. You know I don't go anywhere without my peace. I take my peace with me everywhere. <laughs> now she been on the train, in my car, and she has a peace on her. Oh no. So I was not happy about that at all. But, oh he has me on the mic, but I can tell you we laughed and laughed and laughed and laughed. So I don't have to tell you what else happened when we laughed. So I thought it was just so hysterical. You're such an inspiration and it's kind of hard to, can you, what was your biggest challenge? Can you, is that too big a question to ask? The biggest challenge? I don't know what was the biggest challenge, but I just feel that everything I had to do 
I did it. And, and what happened as I moved with the, the NAACP, which was the organization I became involved in, and that was very helpful because in terms of civil rights, there was Linwood, uh, Linwood Bland, and his uh, other name won't come, you know who I'm talking about, Clarence Falk. These are all individuals who helped to train me with regard to s in civil rights and, and what have you. And so I got right into involved with NAACP in Norwich, and I was the secretary, and I just kept moving and expressing myself wherever I went. I didn't care where, even when I um, part of the, uh, like the, uh, in, uh, uh, it's now the poverty organization. Remember when that organization got uh, three rivers, not three rivers, but the um, organization that was supposed to help poor people and, um, TVCCA, okay, all right. I was, uh, I was one of the founding me members on that organization. And that was an opportunity that you really had to say, hey, we're gonna be a part of the system. And I just, I just met many individuals who really helped me and who was there with me and champion the work that I was doing. And I can't believe that I done what I did. I, I have, I just can't believe that. I did, yes. Uh, you mentioned those folks, uh, something about Mrs. Owens. Oh, Jackie Owens? Yes, ma'am. Well, when I met Jackie, I, was, I had been tired and I've been in a lot of organization, and Jackie uh, became president of the, of the branch. And Jackie was soft-spoken, not like me, loud, one of things, she was real small. And she would come and we would sit down and she would tell me what she want done. Now she, but the, she was smile, uh, uh, was very mild, and she says, "I want you to do so and so and," and I did it. Whatever it was, if she says, "I want you uh, uh, to uh, work with the youth," I did, and so uh, she was mild, didn't talk loud like I did, but she got the job done in her own way, and left her own impression on the community and with the children. She was very uh, concerned and worked hard with the young people because she saw the future that we want to lift our young people up. And that's where I started. I had re worked on a program, it's a dance program. And that's why I have a great uh, a faith in the arts, that the arts are so essential. And if I had money, I will build arts all over and that would be a big part of the curriculum in school because it's healing. You learn, they learn so much. And, um, and I think that's one thing that uh, um, there should be a movement on bringing the arts into the schools and bringing them into the community and working with the young people. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about what it is to be a writer? Well, Patty, walk, walk us through a day. Huh? Walk us through a day of writing. Wake up in the morning when you... You know, to get this book written, I did a lot of stuff. I was not an organized person. Okay, I'm going to get up and I'm going to write three chapters today. Oh, tomorrow I'm going to do this. With so many things going into my life, I did not have an organized plan. I wrote, if I went to a meeting, I will write and then I will have that a piece. If someone asked me to speak, I will write a speech. I would participate in Black History Weeks and I was all over the place and anything I didn't like what the politician was doing, I wrote about that too. <laughs> but it always, there was always writing going on and, um, and I kept most of my notes, unbelievable. I kept them, whether it was the church or what have you. And then I kind of, when I got prepared to write the book, I had all of this. But one thing that I did is we had family reunions. And every time we met, 
I will write a story about a sibling and share their stories. And so it's eight of us, so I had eight stories. I had my mom's story, I had my daddy's story, I had my great grandparents' story because, you know, I, I wrote stories about my great grandfather and I'm not going to I can't tell it now, but I wrote what it was like to meet my great-grandfather. Um, that I really, my mom almost shot him because I thought it was a real old white man was messing with us and, and following us and I didn't like it and I start screaming and we, my mom comes out with the shotgun. And so she didn't care, she was going to use it, you don't mess with my children. And then she drops the shotgun. And he says, Lord, that's your great grandpa. <laughs> <laughs> so I can go on all night. <laughs> so I'm into telling stories too. <laughs> you had a question? How did your father and brother come about coming up to Connecticut? You really want to know the real truth. <laughs> <laughs> My family said, Lottie, you don't have to tell it all. It's not in the book, you don't have to tell it all. <laughs> the truth of it is, my mama got just about tired of my father. And so we decided we go get rid of him. We go send him on a trip. And that's exactly what happened. So she smoothly got him to leave the house and to go to Connecticut. And when he went to Connecticut, you gone. You can't come back. You're learning more about my family than I want to tell, right? But did you have any family in Connecticut? No, we didn't have any family in Connecticut, but we had a lot of individuals who had moved from North Carolina, from South Carolina, to Connecticut. Yeah, but I hope nobody re reads this video. <laughs> so we had family here. Not family, but f uh, people from that area. Longtown, South Carolina, Kershaw, and, and Longtown. They had, we had many people who came here. And the Bowells, you probably know the Bowells. Some of you may know the Bowells. Uh, so we had a, a, a lot who came up here and made their home here. Yes. Did your mom have any reservations about you rejoining your father that she had shipped out? No, no, she, to go and stay, oh no. She was more interested in me leaving the husband and getting away from him. So she didn't have any problem about, about. And um, the thing what about my family, and is my mom, she always taught us to have honor for our father. So what happens with dad has nothing to do with your children. And so we had respect for our father and mother because this is how we were taught. And of course, uh, when, um, when I was, was uh, pregnant with my son, and because a young friend had died when she was a little girl, when she was 15, that I never forgot that experience of a young person dying from childbirth, and I was petrified. My mom just got on the phone and said to dad, listen, Lonnie Mae don't want a midwife. She wants to go to the hospital to have that baby. And so I'm not going to have her crying about this. So you send the money down. That's the kind of relationship, regardless of what had happened, he sent that money down to make sure that I would go to the hospital. So I think that I've had to share with you all more than I usually share with folks. So <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, I had a chance to finish reading your book recently, and I'm curious if since you published it and started talking to people about it and traveled around, uh, what's been the biggest surprise that you found as a result of writing the book? Your personal book. The biggest, my personal? A surprise. Was anything surprising in your experience so far? No. I haven't found anything. Did anybody say anything to you about the book that? Uh, that they didn't like it or? Or was unexpected? Um, I don't recall any of that. I, uh, I thought that people who from South Carolina live where I live, that they would be upset 
because I told stories that they did, would not want to be repeated. But, um, and that's about it. And of course, that might have been one or two. Didn't matter what they thought. So that was, but um, what can I say? Surprise. I know you had mentioned that there was someone who read the book and thought it might be helpful in a teaching Oh, yes, 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 yes. They did it. And I haven't done very much of, about that. But um, this individual who was a business person thought that it was applicable to the workforce and that people could benefit from it. And, uh, but I never got further than that and um, didn't quite understand how he could put it together. But one of the things that I felt that the, uh, the things that I experienced with regard to the book, but also some of the experiences I had, which I didn't do a, a, no have in the book, have to do with working with young people who are looking for opportunities and how it really helped. Sometimes people who are managers just don't know really how to talk to an employee or talk down in a way that is hurtful. And, um, and being uh, sympathetic, being understanding. And what I found out by working in the arts with this group, with the NAACP, how we don't know what troubles that one is having, that we don't know that a child is hungry. And I was kind of shocked as I was working with these youngsters that there was one child that was very hungry and I did not have any idea that this child, that there was hunger and that was other kinds of abuse or in the workplace that people don't know how to talk to individuals in a way that demeans them. And so he, and I t told of my story when I did my presentation on just being so surprised and how one could be helpful to another human being without doing very much. And he thought of this as a way, my presentation on what I experienced in the workplace and how I handled things that it would be enlightened because some managers, people coming from different backgrounds, just may not understand certain things and just, just uh, doing things and not realizing that they may be hurting. And at the same time, you can help someone. And I t this is my last uh, example of anything. Um, I was w went to an pl uh, employment place. Someone was working, and this young woman was heartbroken. And she felt she had been treated very badly by her, or by her supervisor. And I'm sad. He says, I, did, she was trying to explain to me that he was demanding that she did something a certain way. And she just kind of thought that, well, I think it would be better if we did it this way. And she had her reason for it. But he decided to be very, very nasty. And, uh, and so she w didn't know how to handle that. And so I said to her, all right, employee, do you plan to work, do this job the rest of your life here? No. And what are you doing now? She says, I'm going to college, and I expect to do this and that. I says, good. But understand, in the workplace, wherever you go, you could always find someone who are not with it and who got to be mean. And so uh, my message, as he and I was talking, that employee sometime need to be sensitive and maybe culture may be different, but it's just not knowing how to work with people and people can get discouraged. So I guess he saw something in the book that he thought would be beneficial to his employees. And so he um, did invite uh, his executive staff to come and to hear me speak, and I did. Thank you all very much.